Hi, everybody. This is Becky from ESA. I wanted to thank you for joining our uh, leadership happy hour today. Um, just a couple of quick notes before I turn it over to, um, to our team to get us started. Um, we are going to have a very interactive um, happy hour today, um, so we want to encourage your participation. Um, so, one of, uh, so if you have questions for the panelists or anyone who's going to be presenting, please feel free to enter those questions um, in your question box. Um, but we also want you to be interacting with each other, so feel free to, uh, to use the chat function to, um, to say hi to your fellow attendees and, and uh, enjoy a little happy hour banter uh, while we're chatting. And uh, we're also going to have some opportunities. Uh, we're going to be doing some polling, so when those opportunities arise for you to, to give us our feedback, make, um, make sure you, you select um, uh, the appropriate answers that, that reflect what you're thinking and feeling. Um, so thanks again for, for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to Rada to get us started. Great. Thank you, Becky. Well, cheers, everyone. Welcome to our first ever uh, ESA Leadership Happy Hour. And it's in this time when we feel so disconnected and many of us miss branch meetings, um, you know, this is supposed to be a fun event and an event that helps us to think about the future because, um, you know, think about the future of ESA. We know that uh, you know, eventually we'll be able to get together in person again. And so uh, we wanted to get everyone thinking about uh, potentially serving for ESA. So as you think about, um, you're obviously here because someone planted a seed or you've had an interest in potentially pursuing leadership. And, but you may not have crossed over completely to uh, to thinking about being on the ba ballot. So um, some of the reasons to think about pursuing leadership are, you know, one, maybe you just have a strong interest in ensuring a strong future for ESA. Um, we need people to step up and to to help ensure that strong future. And ESA is going to be facing a lot of uh, a lot of challenges in, in the in the coming years, and we need great leaders. Um, another reason that we need to uh, you might consider leadership is you've probably been to a meeting or event or you know been a part of a journal and thought there's a better way to do this. So we need people who, um, you know, have, have had those thoughts and want to drive influence in the society. Um, you know, one of the, the big reasons driving this uh, event this evening is that we absolutely know that we're going to need creativity and diverse solutions and thinking in the future. And the only way to have that is through diverse leadership. And so we want to broaden the scope of, of who is, uh, who's thinking about leadership for ESA so that our leadership reflects our membership. And, um, you know, kind of a byproduct of, of thinking about serving an ESA leadership is that it's really where you start to understand how ESA works and have a new appreciation for what it takes to make a scientific society function. And uh, it's, it's very rewarding to start to understand kind of all of the magic behind the curtain and get to play a role in that. Um, and then, I, you know, I actually want to add one more point to this, which is for me personally, getting involved in ESA leadership has been the best way to meet like the best ESA people, <laughs> because the sort of people that serve are the kind of people you want to know. And it's a chance to meet people nationally and internationally that uh, care about ESA and get to work closely with them on all of these things we just discussed, on driving change, ensuring a strong future for ESA, and uh, bringing creative ideas. So hopefully that's kind of piqued your interest even more in terms of thinking about leadership. And uh, next, I'm going to turn it over to Patty Prasivka. Okay, Rita, and I think you'll stop sharing and I'll put my webcam on, right? Mm -hmm. There I am. Hey, hey everyone. Um, well, just I saw as Rita was introducing things, a few more ticks on the attendance list. So um, before we go on, I'm just going to repeat something Becky said at the beginning. We want this to be interactive. Um, you are on mute, but we want your questions. We want you to type in questions. So if you have a technical question, um, and you need to uh, get ahead of hold of the ESA staff, just type that into the uh, question section that goes just to the ESA staff. Uh, they will be the most likely ones to help you with that. And if you have a question related to our leadership topic, 
um, you can either type it in the question section or the chat section. The chat section will go to everyone, so everyone on the call can see, and that would be a good way to maybe get some interaction between folks. Because I have a feeling there are some folks on the line who are also leaders um, who can answer some questions. So, first thing we'd like to do um, before we talk too much more about leadership is do a quick poll. So I think uh, Becky will take us to our first quick poll. Hopefully a question will pop up here and you're able to select an answer. On average, how many people run for each elected ESA position? So select your best guess, perhaps you know. Um, give it just uh, however long Becky feels is appropriate <laughs> to uh, type in your, or select your answer. See votes continuing to come in, so I'll leave it open for a few more seconds. Thank you. I know he ate stuff. Okay. 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 All right, so there's our results. Um, looks like 60% said one to two. We had quite a few people still, though, say three to four or five to six. So the answer, the correct answer, good job, 60% of you there, is one to two. Um, but I think what, what we thought maybe the perception might be from a lot of folks is we are a big society, and, um, and perhaps we're thinking quite a few people um, volunteer or get on the ballot for a lot of these positions. But um, truly, uh, some, that's the average, some we are um, having a lot of difficulty getting nominations for. And then another thing is uh, about diversity, the, the folks. We want the positions, the volunteer positions to reflect uh, the society's diversity and they don't always do that. So it's important for us to have this uh, uh, session um, to try to encourage more diversity as well. I think there's probably a lot of people out there who wanna volunteer but aren't for various reasons and that kind of brings us to this happy hour. Uh, and I wanted to mention too that uh, the, the deadline for nominations is um, June 1st, so there's still time. Uh, so the first thing though I think we have to do is look at what positions are available so you know, um, and there are positions available on several levels, national, section, and branch. So um, here is our national election um, that will be coming up and what we're looking for nominations for. And I'll stop for just a second or back up and, and mention something as I saw this, maybe some folks on the line don't know or maybe think we elect a president every year, but we don't ever actually elect a president, we elect a vice president elect, and that's a four year term. So each year we elect that vice president elect. Currently the vice president elect is Michelle Smith, so we'll be electing a new vice president elect. And then the vice president elect in year two becomes the vice president and then in year three becomes the president, and in year four becomes the past president. So it's a four-year progression. Um, I don't know, we'll talk a lot about it during this session, but that is common for a lot of positions, especially ones like this, and I think it's a really neat feature of a lot of the um, positions within ESA is that there's kind of a progression that helps you, so we don't just throw you <laughs> into something and say, try to figure out being a president of a huge society. Uh, you get to kind of shadow people and have different levels of responsibility as you go along. So um, we also are looking for an ESA student rep to the ESA governing board, and our current ESA rep is on the call today, so it would be an excellent person to ask some questions, and that's a two-year commitment. So for these positions and the ones on the next slide, um, you can find out more about them by looking at the ESA website, talking to the people that are in the current position, um, people that have uh, used or been in the role in the past. Um, and also the end all, if you just don't know who to call is the ESA staff. They will put you in contact with who you need to, to get advice or information on these positions. So I'm not gonna read through all this. This is, you might, you might have to squint a little at this one and hopefully you haven't had too much beverage yet. But uh, there's a lot on here at the section level. Every section has uh, some positions that they're looking for. Uh, each section will be electing a vice president elect and a treasurer. PBT will be looking for a student rep to the ESA governing board and PI and CCB are looking for student reps to their section governing boards, just to name a few. And you can see the folks that are in these positions right now. And again, those are excellent people to ask uh, for information about what it's like to serve in these positions. And then the last slide of positions um, is the branch election. Um, 
And I want to point out, we have the international branch, uh, the president-elect and the secretary, and then the North Central branch rep to the ESA governing board and the folks that are in those positions. But I also want to point out that there are ways to volunteer um, other roles at all these levels, national section and branch, like serving on committees, the awards committees, common names, diversity and inclusion, early career professionals, education and outreach. I wrote them all down, but I won't bore you with them all. They're all on the website that you can find that. You go to the website under resources and volunteer with ESA. And then if you're logged on as a, uh, with your membership ID, then you can get really down in there and see what all these positions are and get a lot more information there. You can fill out your own profile about what you're interested in uh, so that folks they're looking for nominees and they call you. So that's another great way to get involved. Um, and the best way to find out about all these other committees that aren't on there, maybe your section is going to have a special tour and they're looking for volunteers to help or doing something special at a meeting and need a committee or something formed around that is to talk to some of these folks that are in the current offices. Um, or again, when all else fails, contact the ESA staff. They can hook you up with who you need to talk to. So we have five guest leaders here today, and they are excellent. I'm really excited to hear from all of them. We're going to give each of them kind of a two-minute drill, two to three-minute drill, elevator speech. Tell us uh, the most fascinating things about them. Tell us about uh, some of their leadership experience. Um, give us a little flavor for, uh, for themselves. And just as a reminder for anybody who came in late, if you have questions, if you want to address to everybody, the panel and everyone on the call, type that into the chat. Everyone will be able to see that. Sometimes that may help for another question, or you may say, ah, I was going to ask that, but I was kind of embarrassed to ask that. Um, and again, there may be some other leaders on the line who could chat back to that person and give another perspective. If you want to send it anonymously or just to the ESA staff and the, the panelists who will be checking those, questions, you can type it into the question section too. We just want to get those questions. So as these folks are introducing themselves, feel free to start typing in those questions. And I'm going to turn it over to Lena to take it away and introduce herself. Thank you, Patty, uh, for the introduction uh, and for inviting me to be part of the Leadership Happy Hour. I am really happy and honored uh, to share my experience with all the attendees, my experiences holding, holding some of the uh, leadership positions in ESA. Hopefully that will help um, some of you that may think already uh, to run to those, one of those positions to feel more encouraged and, and you know get into the ballot. So to give you a little bit of background about myself, I am originally from Lima, Peru. I did my undergraduate studies in biology and after a while working in my home country I decided to come to the States to pursue my graduate studies. So I hold a master's degree in agronomy and crop science in Louisiana State University. And then I switched to, um, over to entomology to do my PhD because always my passion has been the study, I mean, host plant resistant in general, but I, I've always been fascinated how plants can react when they are under stress, different kinds of stresses. So, um, uh, said that um, in the, uh, parallel to my research, I also had a fortune to hold uh, a number of ESA positions, as you can see uh, in, on the slide. Uh, and I don't want to enumerate all of them, but I can tell you what I am currently, um, uh, in which positions I am currently. I am the student rep to the governing board. And also I am the chair of the Student Affairs Committee. And until two days ago, I was the chair of the Early Career Professionals of the Southeastern Branch. So um, why, I was, uh, why I wanted to volunteer or why I was interested in volunteering in the first place? Um, well, I always wanted to uh, do, develop more my social network and improve uh, my soft skills that I know are very important when you want to land a job. So uh, actually, that's something that I'm currently doing because I'm uh, looking for jobs. So uh, really, uh, these skills are helping me to uh, hopefully match the best, the best uh, job in the future. And, and at the same time, I really wanted to push myself to leave my comfort zone and to prove that I had a potential to uh, be in those positions. So 
I started first small in small positions uh, within my department at LSU. First, uh, for example, I was the president of the Entomology Graduate Student Association. I also led many outreach uh, activities in my department, in university level, and also in my community. So uh, having those positions uh, really helped me to improve my confidence to keep pursuing uh, other leadership positions, uh, for example, in ESA. And in my mind always was uh, with a purpose of representing, representing not only Latinos, but also internationals in general. Um, I, uh, my desire is really to provide a greater representation of internationals within our society. And hopefully we can, we are doing better on that. So how did I get involved in these ESA leadership positions? Well, uh, two things motivated me the most. First, my desire to volunteer, which is something that I really encourage and I'm, I'm hoping that many of you that are in this webinar are thinking about to run to, in one of these positions. If you have the desire, that's really already, uh, you are there almost 90%. So you sometimes uh, don't feel that you don't have enough time because you cannot commit, to the, commit enough to these positions or maybe you are not a uh, well qualified to uh, be in those positions. That's not true. And based on my experience, I started with zero experience and the experience you get it while you are in those positions actually. So uh, the other second uh, thing that motivated me uh, to you know, uh, be in those leadership positions was uh, networking. That's also very important. Sometimes if you already know a leader that is in uh, one uh, position that you are thinking about to run, maybe you can ask uh, more about that talking to uh, that person and you know, in that way you are also uh, building your own network. So maybe next time leaders will actually contact you to run to those positions. So uh, I guess a network sometimes is it by itself. So um, I would like to stop there. And if you have more questions, hopefully uh, after our presentation, we can uh, address those. So uh, I will get back to Patty. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. Uh, Chris is next. Chris, are you getting your mute off? Okay. Here we go. Yeah, I'm Chris Gaddon. I'm a I'm a research entomologist with USDA in Gainesville, Florida, and I'm with the with the Move section. And I started out with an undergraduate degree in biology and philosophy from Boston College, then went to grad school at UMass Amherst, and then I did two postdocs, one at NC State, and then a second one at Cornell for a few years before ending up in Gainesville. I guess I could say that the house fly has been very good to me. I've been working on house fly and its relatives and other filth flies for most of my career, especially looking at biological control and behavior of the flies. And it's been it's been a great it's been a great ride. I first got interested in volunteerism and leadership when I was a postdoc for the reasons that Lena has pointed out, that the networking also for career advancement, um, you know, just as a young person thinking it would be good to show some sort of tangible involvement in the society. So I began looking for things that I could do. And at the time, it wasn't really clear how you got yourself into, into stuff. And so I was at a business meeting one time, and I didn't know how you get into a position. And they said, oh, well, let's see, we have, a, we have an opening on the Annals Editorial Board. And normally, they were supposed to have already arranged for somebody to be nominated, but they, they, nobody, they didn't have one. So I raised my hand and self-nominated. Oh, I said, I'll, I'll do it. And there was sort of a hush over the room and they had to ask, well, is that allowed? Can you self-nominate? So they, but they, they let me do it. And that was how I got started. And after that, I just sort of did one thing after another because um, I really enjoyed getting to work with other people, all the, all the people that I got to meet. And I've done a lot of different things over the years. But one thing I really want to emphasize is that it, it can seem intimidating to take on a new position. But if there's a name for that position, that means somebody's done it before. And so you're gonna, there's always great help. You're, the, the people who've gone before you are there. And I can't say enough good things about ESA staff. I mean, the, the people at ESA are wonderful and they'll tell you what you need to do. So really, you, know, you, you don't need to have much in the way of pre-existing qualifications to do any of the leadership opportunities that, that are out there. 
And I found it to be just a tremendously rewarding experience. The friends that I made, the networks, the connections for collaborations and for just fellowship in general have been have been very, very um, beneficial. And it's been a real a real joy to get to see how things work on the inside. You know, so many members think that ESA is run by some kind of a secret cobble and uh, that, 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 that the membership really doesn't have much say in how things are done. And I always tell our members that we are we are the leadership. I mean, it, it's just it's just folks that, are, that serve in these positions and they're turning over. There is no leadership class that you need to get into. Just, uh, you know, get involved and uh, if your section has a nominating committee, find out how you get uh, get uh, get recognized by the nominating committee, or by all means, self-nominate or nominate a friend. There's 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 very little in the way of um, you know, barriers to getting involved. Um, I, I'll also say that when I when I first was asked to run for the section uh, president position, I said no, thank you, I'm unworthy. And then they asked me again a couple of years later, and I said sure, but I lost. So that's the other thing is, you know, if you get, you don't necessarily win. <laughs> we had three people that year and, uh, and somebody else won. Then a few years later, I ran again and that time I won. But it's, it's, it's been a fantastic experience. And at this point, I will, um, anything else that may come up by way of questions, we'll take them up later on. Thank you, Patty. Okay. Uh, our next uh, speaker, our next panelist is Jennifer. Get away, Jennifer. Hi everyone, um, thank you for inviting me here. My name is Jennifer Gordon. I am currently a, an urban entomologist for Douglas Products, supporting our structural fumigation business. I also do some work supporting our quarantine fumigation business as well. I think my professional path is maybe a little bit different than some. I studied insecticide resistance and mosquitoes and bedbugs at LSU and at the University of Kentucky. And then when I finished that, I went into the consumer packaged goods industry for a little while. So I supported some of the brands um, such as Raid or maybe you've heard of Clorox disinfecting wipes in this time of the pandemic. Um, but I really missed entomology and urban entomology. So that's where I got back into structural uh, pest management. The reason why I have done leadership roles is, you know, service is an important aspect for me. I really like giving back. I get a lot out of the association. And, you know, one of the things that we're talking about is like, how do you get involved? And for me, you know, it started kind of the, the entomology um, adjacent roles. I was a master's student at LSU. Didn't think I was qualified for anything. And we had a secretary position open and nobody volunteered. And I was, you know, basically volunteered to do it. And, you know, at the time I was incredibly nervous and didn't know what to do, but it turned out to be a really great experience. Um, you know, I got to organize a lot of events, which led into project management and project management is something that I do a lot now. And also, you know, taking notes, which, you know, is, is one of those things that is a really vital skill. So, I, you know, I built a lot of skills that way and leadership just started from there. Um, my first leadership role with ESA was actually organizing a symposia. And the reason why I organized that symposia was I wanted to see it. You know, I hadn't seen the symposia that I wanted to see before, so I went and I, I did it. And my first leadership position, I was the MOVE representative to the Science Policy Committee. And, you know, again, I had no idea that it was going to come. I had mentioned to a professor that since I had left academia and I was in industry, I wanted to stay active within ESA and you know there was this position and nobody was volunteering for it again and I was sitting in the back of the conference room and a, a professor stood up and goes you know I nominate Jennifer Gordon and somebody else nominated themselves and we both at the final business meetings stood up and we gave our spiels about why we should be the one that is selected for that position and I, I got it and <clears throat> you know it was a great experience a lot like what Chris was talking about, it really gave me an opportunity to get a peek behind the curtain. My first committee meeting, I was terrified. I didn't know what we were gonna say or what we were going to do. But again, it was a great experience. Um, you know, through that experience, I helped write one pagers for ESA. I have networked amazingly. Just like what Rada was talking about, you know, some of the best people I've ever met are through the ESA leadership positions. There is a sense of fellowship, a sense of networking. Um, it's great experience. You know, as much as you put into it, 
you get just as much back. And, you know, I'll say that it's also helped me a lot in my professional life. Uh, a lot of what I do is finding people to collaborate with, with research and ESA and my participation has helped in that. You know, chances are anybody that I want to collaborate with in one way or another, I can probably reach out to them directly, you know, via text or email. And if I can't do that, then chances are through these positions, I have, I know somebody who can get me in touch with that person. So, you know, my volunteerism and, and leadership within ESA has been a give and take. You know, it's, it's helped me out tremendously, but I also try to give as much as I get. And, you know, I, I really benefited from it. And I highly recommend it to anybody. Um, I currently don't have a role within leadership. This is the first time I haven't in a, a long time. And kind of like what Chris was saying, you know, I nominated myself for Secretary of Move and I didn't get it, and that's okay. And during this beginning, I actually took down some notes of some other positions that I think that I would be a really good fit for. So I've already gotten something out of this webinar. And when I get off of here, I'm actually going to pursue, I think, at least two things that, that seem interesting to me. Um, but that's who I am and, and that's why I do this. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Before I turn it over to Floyd, um, I just want to give a little tech update. Um, it seems the chat is maybe not working properly. So if you do have questions, type it into that question section of um, the features there on the GoToMeeting. Um, if you type something into the chat already, if you could just grab it and copy it over or retype it into the questions to make sure that um, the other organizers here can see it and get those questions to the panelists when we get to that point. But until then, uh, we have two more of our panelists to go. So I'm gonna turn it over to Floyd Shockley. Thanks, Patty. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm currently the collections manager uh, for the Department of Entomology at the National Museum of Natural History. Um, I didn't start off on that path. I actually, uh, when I was uh, an undergraduate, uh, I got my degree in biology and I was actually pre-med uh, and uh, ended up uh, trying something a little bit outside of my comfort zone. And I went and got a master's in entomology at the University of Missouri, uh, where actually I was working in a completely different field. I was in insect plant interactions and host plant resistance back then, working on potato leaf hopper and alfalfa. Uh, but it was while I was there that I discovered my interest in biodiversity, uh, in taxonomy, in morphology. And so I followed that into my PhD uh, at the University of Georgia. Uh, and I graduated in 2009 and then I taught for a year at the university and then uh, took the position uh, in DC. Uh, so a little bit about my leadership. Uh, I, I honestly in high school I wasn't terribly involved in leadership and I started to get more interested in uh, serving uh, in various uh, academic groups uh, while I was in college. And then when I got into my graduate uh, degrees, both of my advisors uh, were both very supportive of getting involved. Uh, both of them uh, mentioned multiple times the importance of, of not, not uh, volunteering because you're trying to get something out of it or to pad your CV, but uh, the importance of just civic duty, duty, just serving a society that you care about. Um, and something that I've sort of carried with me uh, along my, my trajectory has always been that, uh, uh, especially leadership in, a, in an organization as big and diverse as, as ESA, uh, you, have, you have two options. You can either let things happen uh, and, and just sort of be an observer, or you can, you, can, you can actually be involved in those changes. And uh, I, I wanted to be involved and, my gateway, like many of the folks here, was through uh, committee service first. Um, that's, a, that's a great gateway drug to kind of get your feet wet, uh, learn a little bit more about the inner workings of the, of the society without uh, sort of the full formal commitment of, of an elected position. Many of those are, are appointed positions. Um, they have them at the branch level, at the section level, and I've, I've been involved in all of those. Um, and so uh, I just continued using those opportunities uh, to learn more and more about the society. And as you learn more as a leader, you become more valuable 
as a leader. And so it often becomes a very organic thing that you end up, uh, you know, getting elected to more and more things just because of uh, sort of what you've shown in the previous position. So, you know, you don't necessarily have to have to think you need to jump in with both feet and run for vice president elect of ESA, although if you would like to do that, we certainly encourage it, but you don't have to feel like you need to do that. There's lots of ways to serve the society uh, and uh, a lot of us uh, sort of worked our way up. Uh, my my positions are actually ending, so this this is my last year. I was president of the ESA uh, CISEB section last year, so I'm past president now, and I'll rotate off of the governing council. Uh, and so um, I've sort of gone again. The only thing I haven't really done is is run for one of the national offices. Um, and so uh, I'm happy to talk about sort of my my trajectory during the during the question and answer, uh, but uh, otherwise I'll go ahead and yield back time so we can keep keep on time. Thanks, Floyd. Um, and our last panelist, Susan Weller. Come on. I think we have you there for a minute, Susan. Okay. There you go. I think you're back on mute again or your audio. How's that? There, we got gotcha. you. Got back. Okay. We'll try again. I am not going to touch the touchpad again. We're just going to wave the wine in front of the cam. All right. I hope you're all having a good time. Um, I've had many different roles, and you might be wondering why ESA um, and who I am. Um, let's see, let's start with who I am. I am the director of a university uh, museum of natural history at Nebraska, um, and that's why I have a mammoth as opposed to a insect on my shirt, but there you are. There's a flea or a tick on it somewhere, I'm sure. I'm sure I could make move happy here. Um, and um, and I just got into museums during my career. I had started off at University of Texas, Austin for my PhD after an undergrad at a small liberal arts college. And I got adopted uh, when I went to the Natural History Museum and the Smithsonian because I was this systematist who was wandering around studying Lepidoptera. And um, and my advisor decided to uh, head away from the University of Texas and left us all behind, which was fine. Um, we had other people we could work with, and ESA became my safety net. You know, thanks to Jackie Miller, uh, who I know Floyd and some others on this call might know, um, she took me under her um, forewing, so to speak, and uh, she helped me um, navigate. Uh, and network uh, both in the Lepidopterist Society and at ESA. And for that reason, I have really been passionate about giving back to the society. I feel I owe my career to these uh, professional networks um, because I was sort of bouncing around there by myself for a little while at a very vulnerable stage, graduate school. Um, and I loved getting people together to discuss research. So instead of coming through sort of the normal committee uh, line of work, I came through as a symposium organizer as a volunteer. And like Chris and others, it's like, well, you know, are, are grad students and postdocs allowed to do this? And the answer is, well, yeah, there's no rule that you can't organize a symposium or a workshop for a, a meeting. So just uh, for those of you who are on the call, do it. Uh, ask forgiveness later if you must, but generally uh, we like people to be involved. So uh, people will not say no to people who wish to work um, and help. So um, quick time check. Okay, I've got a little more time. Um, what have I learned or found most enjoyable about ESA? Um, certainly the people. Um, 
getting to work with lots of great, wonderful people and um, an unexpected benefit. I have learned about uh, finances and forecasting in nonprofits, which has had an unexpected benefit as I've been trying to lead a museum which doesn't have an academic budget. It has more of a nonprofit real world budget. So uh, who'd have known that having been involved with the governing board at, uh, for our society would have helped me learn how to read really important financial data. So unexpected benefit. Uh, otherwise, um, I don't know. Uh, I just hope that all of you who are on the line uh, listening to this will consider uh, volunteering at some level, some leadership level, and uh, you'll learn so much about yourself and others, and it's really deeply rewarding. So uh, looking forward to your questions, and uh, thank you all very much for being here. Um, thank you guys. Thank you for giving us a, a little flavor for uh, your background and your leadership roles. And thank you for the people who have submitted some questions already. Keep those coming. Um, some of the workshop organizers are in the background right now, kind of looking through those and um, kind of coming up with a list to ask the panel. And those will be coming up in a second. But before we do that, um, well, one more reminder on that. Make sure if you have a question, try to type it in the question section, um, not the chat section for now, because the chat doesn't quite seem to be working. Um, and that will go to the organizers and they will ask the panel those questions. And um, we're going to go to one more quick poll that Becky will bring up here. So we have the question, um, what concerns for, are preventing you from seeking an ESA office? So this one you can select any and all that apply. Um, however, if you look through this list and it's not what, what your reason is not on there, <laughs> or it's something beyond this. Um, type in the questions section, uh, type what your concerns are if we didn't really capture them in one of these uh, options that we put up here. So we can kind of record that and, and relay that to, uh, to some of the panel and things like that. So any and all of these that you feel are preventing you from seeking some kind of a position. Or if it's not listed here, it's something unique, something we just have not captured, tape it in the chat, or sorry, the question section, so we can capture that. I'll give you a few minutes. Okay, um, and you can keep chatting, or keep typing those in the question section if there are things that we haven't captured, but it looks like there's quite a few folks um, 56% said, I do not believe I have enough leadership experience. So maybe we'll address that a little bit um, in uh, some of our discussion here. But there's a little bit of everything it looks like. Um, not feeling like you don't have enough time, you're not far enough along, you don't understand the nomination pro process, and, and maybe some even that their workplace doesn't encourage or value that involvement. So Thank you for answering that. That's really valuable for us to see because the only way that we can truly move forward from this and maybe remove some of the barriers is to understand what they are. So um, I think at this point then we're gonna try to open up for some questions. Um, I know Melissa's been looking uh, in the background at some of these questions and I know I kind of had some questions. Melissa, do you have one you'd like to start with? Yeah. Start? Uh, or Hong Mei? Hong Mei first. Okay. Yeah. Hong Mei question if not oh. I can go okay hi everyone yeah my name is Hong Mei Lee Byerle um just co-organizing the happy hour so we have a few questions coming in so one of the question um this is from Anne Tran uh, she said for the student representative to the uh, ESA governing board does the representative have to be a student during the entire two-year time um because she may be um a going into graduate next year so that's why she's asking about this for any panel uh, I, can, I can take that question um, well uh, no it's, i don't think so it's a problem because when i ran last time i was in, in between my last year of my phd so uh, in my term ends this november and it has been already one year since i am postdoc so um, but 
I don't know if uh, things will change, but as far as I know, that's not a problem. Great, thank you, Lina. Um, yeah, Melissa, do you wanna ask another question? Good, uh, thanks, Hong Mei. My name is Melissa Siebert. I'm uh, the PI representative to the governing board. Glad to be here today. I'm gonna address a couple of the things that kind of came up in the last poll, and I'm gonna ask the panelists a couple questions. Uh, first, I wanna alert everybody that at the, in five more minutes, we are going to for sure allow Becky Anthony to go over the nomination process, and then we'll come back to questions. So that was uh, one of the poll questions where there's some uncertainty. Uh, but the next thing, uh, somebody mentioned, uh, my workplace does not encourage or value involvement. So Jennifer, I'm gonna go back to you. Uh, you work for industry. Um, how does that conversation go with your employer and, and getting the buy-in to your attention to ESA? Uh, can you tell me if you had a challenge like that? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a great question, and, and it's definitely something that I have encountered. Um, you know, just speaking really candidly, when it comes to industry, it's, for me, it's relating back to them what they get out of it. So again, I mentioned that the majority of my job is making relationships and collaborating with research. So whenever, with other researchers, so whenever I'm asked to create an external partnership, you know, I always highlight right then and there that the reason why I'm able to do this is through ESA, that I have this connection in one way or another through ESA. Um, another thing that I have found to be really helpful is bringing it up during the interview process. You know, when you're interviewing with a company, you know, they're asking you questions to see if you're a good fit, but it's also important for you to bring up the, the key things that are important for you. So I often, in the last two interviews that I've had, I've brought up, you know, I'm very active in ESA, I have these leadership roles, will you support me? So sometimes if I end up getting feedback, you know, is participation in the association beneficial to the business? I'm able to bring up how it's already been beneficial, but then I'm also able to bring back to the interview process that, you know, we had this conversation. So, you know, it's a lot about communication. It's a lot about selling the benefits of it. And it's a, well, I mean, honestly, it's a lot about continuously selling the benefits in my experience. Perfect, thanks, Jennifer. Um, Hong Mei, uh, do you have another question? If not, I can uh, go with another, but are you ready? Uh, yeah. So here's the next question. Um, so uh, this is from Ann Mayo. Um, so she's very interested in volunteering or serving the society. Um, so she did it, volunteered um, when she was graduate student. And now she's in a position where it is very difficult for her to come to the meeting. So are there any opportunities still for her or for people like her? Mm -hmm. I guess uh, yeah, panelists, so jump in, uh, any one of you guys. I see a lot of heads nodding. Let's go ahead and give some examples. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in if you, if you, if I, I, I all I can say is that uh, there's actually a fair number of people um, that uh, volunteer, especially uh, as committee members that can't always uh, participate in the meetings, but we also have folks who are volunteering on editorial boards, uh, as subject editors for our journals, uh, and many of those folks are not necessarily in situations where they can attend the meeting every year, uh, and that's fine. Um, we do try and have in-person meetings uh, of many of our groups, but uh, it's almost never 100% uh, because of that very thing. But we value volunteers, whether they can be at the annual meeting uh, or whether they're volunteering in, in in any number of other ways, so. And I would add, don't forget your branches. Uh, branch meetings are often less expensive, and yet they often have a great cross-section of um, your region and experts, and it's, um, it's a way to be involved that is quite frankly, extremely cost-effective if you're trying to get there, bring students, or you're a postdoc, so uh, don't forget your branches. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think those are very good points. Um, so I think, Lisa, should we let Becky talk about uh, the ballot? We're gonna squeeze one more question in for, for operational Go excellence before Becky goes. Uh, so yeah. one of the comments was, we don't have enough time to serve. 
And, and Floyd, you touched on that a little bit, but I'm going to go to Susan. So I'm going to put Susan, uh, you know, she's been president. She's done a number of things. And everybody said, you know, tell, tell me about, uh, you know, the time commitment. And, you know, you know, I know Floyd even touched on the support that ESA has. So, you know, what can you help uh, discuss with uh, attendees on the time commitment and the people who are considering the not enough time to serve? I think it's really important to um, talk with people who have held the role and staff and also to triangulate. I can't tell you how many times I was told, oh, you know, I spent every working hour doing X, Y, and Z. Um, you don't have to. You can find the volunteer experience that fits your time budget. And I will say I have learned how to prioritize. I have learned how to be very efficient, sometimes ruthlessly efficient. Um, you can do laundry and answer emails and keep on top of your volunteerism. Um, just you can do it. Um, but you have to find joy in the volunteer task that you choose. It can't be something you're doing just to have a line on your CV. And so really look for that piece that really you know, drives you, that makes you want to be engaged, and find out how to volunteer in that area. Um, and I did push off. I was asked several times to run for president, and I did not, because I really was having way more fun with program symposia and whatnot. And then I, I finally got convinced after coming through as rep for North Central Branch that there could be time. I could make time for this. And ESA staff stepped up and they made time. So that um, you can design your volunteer situation to fit what you can do. So don't let that don't let a misimpression of someone being real macho, you know, scare you off. Be realistic, but but don't get scared off, please. Perfect. Thanks, Susan. Hey, Becky, so we're going to transition to you. What I would encourage everybody after we hear from Becky, please hang on, don't hang up, and uh, we'll continue the Q&A when she's finished. Uh, thanks, Melissa. Um, so for those who do not know me, um, uh, one of my many roles at ESA from uh, our headquarters office is uh, I actually facilitate, currently facilitate and manage our entire elections process at the national branch and section level. Um, so getting on the ballot is a whole lot easier than what you think. Um, all candidates need um, a headshot um, and a bio of 250 words or less, um, which most people, I find most people already have in some form or fashion. It's just a matter of tweaking it to, to get on this, um, for being on a, a, an elected position. Um, people who are considering running for uh, the ESA vice president elect, um, they do need to do a little bit more work in that there needs to be um, a, their statement just on the critical issues facing the society and what their vision is for the future. Um, but besides that, it's just, you know, just the headshot in, in the bio. Um, the second step is just is an obtaining an endorsement for the branch or section, and I will say um, I will add the caveat that this is only required for the ESA vice president elect position. All of the other positions are open um, for you to either self nominate, have a colleague nominate you, or you can be nominated by your branch or section leaders. So if you're, I would encourage you if you're if you're trying to feel things out to reach out to your branch and section leaders. Um, but if you've already decided you want to run for something, go ahead and nominate yourself. You can see the the link at the bottom of the page, uh, the bottom of the slide, um, where you can find the nomination form. Um, and so all nominations need to be. Uh, need to be submitted um, online by June 1. Um, it's, it's just a couple of quick questions and uploading those two documents uh, to get you on the ballot. Um, and then the final step is um, once you've submitted your nomination form online, you'll be sent an email as a candidate to complete a professional conduct disclosure. And as long as that conduct disclosure has been um, signed and or has been completed online by June 2nd, you're on the ballot. Um, so it's super simple. Um, and because I monitor all of the ballots or all of the nominations as they come in, if there happens to be a piece that's missing, I reach out to you really quick and I won't let you miss out on an opportunity um, to, to be nominated as a candidate for that position if you're interested. Uh, so I hope that, that dispels some of the uh, 
some of the, the doubts you may have about how easy or hard it is to, to get on the, on the ballot. Good, so if anybody has any. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say to you before we go back to questions, I think, um, you know, yeah. I think many of us, any of us and, and, and ESA staff would be willing to, you know, talk with you one on one if you, you know, want to go online and look at these things. I mean, they're, they're there to help and they really want to help. So if you need more personal um, review or step through any of this process. I'm sure they're willing to do that. And take it away, Melissa. Thanks, Becky. And I think uh, before we transition to Becky, I could tell Chris maybe wanted to say something too. So Chris, can you uh, give us some uh, insights in some of those last questions we had for our last panelists? Well, I just wanted to echo what Susan said about, about, about having time to do some of these service things. You know, when I, when I discovered I was interested in serving on the governing board, people looked at me like I was crazy saying, well, I'm glad you have time for that. That, that job's going to eat you alive. And that was not my experience. Yeah, it, it, it took time, but it, it really, it was, you know, several days a year was the main commitment. And the rest of the year, it was it was just the odd email here and there. So um, none of these service positions, the president is another matter. But for the most part, mo most of the, most of the, most of the um, elected and service positions just don't take that much time. And um, really anybody can fit it in the schedule. I want to say another thing about nominations too. At the sectional level, I know in the move section, we have a nominating committee. And a lot of the members think that that, that in order to get um, elected or appointed to serve in a position, you have to somehow know somebody or, or get through the nominating committee. And in our case, anyway, the nominating committee's only job is to make sure that at least one person is identified to fill a vacancy. And, you know, we are open to any anybody who wants to self-nominate or nominate somebody else. Uh, the nominating committee is not meant to vet or restrict in any way who gets to serve. It's just to make sure that somebody is found to fill every position that has to be filled. That's all. Good. Thanks, Chris. Um, would somebody have a comment? Uh, no, Melissa, I'm just saying um, we probably have a, a few minutes more for questions. There, there are still a few questions. Um, okay. Are you, do you yeah, see any new questions? questions? Go ahead. Uh, can I, can uh, I ask well, a question or may you have one? Yeah. Okay, well, how many, I mean, we have three more questions coming in. So can I, can we? Do all three, or you want me to pick one of them? No, nope. yeah, uh, I, I, I think our panelists can stay on a little longer too, so we can cover any and all the questions we have. And okay, yeah. So I use the next question. Um, it's about the position um, rotations. So for some of the positions, they're open, and there are also particular rotations in certain sections. Uh, or certain branches like uh, uh, the medical, urban, uh, veterinarian entomology. So it, it can be discouraging in that um, if you think you have time this year, but then it may not be ready when it might be next year, like for your group to, to do the term. Does that make sense? I guess the question is what, what do you do with the rotation? Like you sign up for two years, but you don't really do the work until the second year. Any anybody? Well, I I can only speak for myself. I didn't I didn't find that to be the case. Uh, almost every position that I that I've been involved in, I was immediately uh, sort of involved. Uh, the, the the one thing that I, I'm it's a little unclear is if we're talking about um, you know you make the commitment and then your time commitment changes uh, that's a very different question and of course it's one that everyone deals with but we also have mechanisms in place if if your situation changes and you need to 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 step off there's a way to handle that um, so. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about if you can't predict what you know is going to happen three years from now 
uh, and let that be a burden for you uh, or, a, or a block for you to be involved for the two years that you can. Um, I, I don't really, I'm, I'm still not quite sure what the question is, but. I think it has to do with predicting my future ability to serve. And I would just say, uh, this is where you learn how to delegate and how you need to understand um, you don't have to lead by yourself. You have a team. You have your past president, your current, if you are current president, you have your vice president and your vice president elect or your secretary or treasurer or whatever part of the rotation there is. And everybody's helping everybody and you just have to ask for help and be comfortable doing so. What you might want to do is start with a smaller commitment on a committee, serve as three years on, say, education and outreach, or one of the annual editors or journal editors or something, and get a feel for it. But it's, you're not, a, believe me, if I thought I was going to be the only person leading the band as president, I never would have signed up. Because <laughs> it just, whoa, yeah. Well, and, I, and just to call back to something that Susan and Chris both said, I don't think we can emphasize enough how easy the ESA staff makes it um, as painless as possible on, on us uh, in terms of keeping us on track, keeping keeping the trains moving on time, doing a lot of the heavy lifting so that we're basically providing, uh, serving almost in an advisory capacity uh they really do make it easy uh on those folks who volunteer because i think i think they genuinely appreciate the fact that we're volunteering our time and we're not getting paid for it uh and so they really do a lot of the heavy lifting for us and, yeah, and if I, yeah those uh, are all great comment, uh, answers thank you yeah and, and if i may I, I believe the question also had to do with the move section because it does have a rotational nature in with some of its positions where we in the section uh, tend to alternate between members of uh, representatives from medical urban and veterinary and so certain some positions at least at the at the president level and uh and, and the nominating committee we do have we do have a succession so that people are rotating to try to make sure we get representation from the three major uh sub disciplines so that is a challenge if you're interested in running for president but and you're in urban, but the but the but urban isn't due for two more years. Then that's just sort of baked into the way the way the section does business. And I'm not really sure there's much that can be done about that. Okay, great. Yeah, that's a great information. So, Patty, I think you had a question you were interested in asking. Do you have anything you were thinking? Yeah, I I wanted to ask each one of you um, if you could give an example of. The most valuable connection you made through your leadership role. Well, uh, I can start, and I'm taking your question related with a specific person, or is it right? It, it could be a specific person, or something that led to something significant in your career. Something, you know, however you want to take it. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, uh, the most influential person to me so far has been Susan Weller. Uh, I'm not ashamed to say that uh, Susan, she's amazing in what she does and that way how she does things. It's so calm down. It really inspired me to keep pursuing other leadership positions and, you know, like uh, be like her because uh, you take a, a role model and you try to follow and probably improve, hopefully, and be better. Uh, but uh, you need to pick somebody that you admire. In, in your, one part of your uh, professional development and you know like uh, try to do the best so that's the most uh, valuable for me oh thank you lena i i'm just like in tears because uh, to me the the lifeblood of our society are the people are our early career professionals mid-career i mean guys are the society of the future and like Jackie before me, it's my job to help you grow and, and be successful. I, I'm just so happy to be your mentor. Thank you. Um, this yeah. is Jennifer. I'll go next. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. 
Sorry. Is it okay if I go next? Okay. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to answer this a little bit differently because, you know, at first I thought about, you know, a connection from the research side that really helped my career. And I could tell you that person um, or mentorship as well, which I think is important. But I want to come at it as a different way because I don't know like how easily it is for people to make friends later in life. But I met one woman, um, Megan Pensler, through my leadership roles at ESA. And while Megan has been very influential in my professional development, she served as a peer reviewer for me on a publication, which becomes challenging when you're no longer in academia and she's reviewed some presentations of mine before I've given them again to have a, an extra set of eyes. She's also become an amazing friend. And now at this point, I would probably say 75% of the texts that we send each other have absolutely nothing to do with entomology anymore. And that has absolutely been a progression. Like it was very, very professional to begin with. And then there were some memes. And now it has just transitioned to, I probably talk to this person every single day, even if it's just some stupid little thing that made me laugh or I thought would make her laugh. So, you know, I just wanted to bring up that aspect of, of serving as well. You know, Chris mentioned fellowship and fellowship is important. Chris, Lloyd, anything you want to add? Yeah, I, I, would, I would just add a couple of things. I mean, for me, it's not so much about the professional connections and collaborations as really the personal friendships. And you never know when, you know, when those things are going to are going to bear fruit in, in all kinds of ways, large and small. So it's it's as well, I'm not going to pick a person and say, oh, this is the most important connect that I've made. There have just been too many. Uh, I would also like to do a shout out to some of the ESA staff. I mean, Racina Romano, to me, is an example of unflappability. I mean, she, she she runs this meeting every year, and for most of the membership, she's behind the scenes. Nobody knows what she's doing, but she is absolutely fearless at tackling running this uh, our, our annual meeting, and she's a role model for me in terms of organization. So, yeah, there, there, were, there were just too many too many great people that I've met that I to, to try to pick one or two, but that's a well, – uh, yeah, so actually I came into ESA leadership sort of through the side door, having been uh, heavily involved in the Entomological Collections Network, um, which many, it has a very broad overlap with the uh, systematics uh, section membership. Um, but being a collections person, it was certainly an organization I was more uh, heavily involved in. It tends to have more of the museum sorties. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, SISCB tends to be uh, a lot more of the uh, academic systematists, I would say. And so uh, I served, actually, I founded, uh, co-founded the uh, current leadership structure uh, before I took on leadership in, in ESA. Uh, but, you know, the fact that we had such really great uh, collaborations between ECN and and CCB basically since uh, since I've been involved with with ECN kind of made it a really smooth transition and many of the leaders in that organization have also been leaders both of the section as well as um, as well as the as, as of the society as a whole Susan of course uh, Mike Ivy uh, you know, the, there's there's just a ton of leaders, and Jackie. You know, um, you know she's been a she's been a guiding hand since I was a grad student. She was one of the first ones uh, to uh, tell me to 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 get involved if I really thought things ought to be a certain way. And so um, it is tough to kind of narrow down because that's one of the beauties of ESA is there's so many people influencing us in the smallest and largest of ways that it's uh, it's really tough to nail down which one is sort of that quintessential thing. But uh, I, I've valued all of those all of those relationships and everything I've learned from everybody, including uh, all of the panelists here tonight. Well, good. Well, I, I want to answer one question that came up, and it was just somebody, uh, I believe they're from South Asia, again, kind of in this similar vein about ability to travel. Just want to remind uh, that, that individual that we do have the international branch. We have a couple positions over there, uh, open there, and in fact, the president is from, I believe, uh, South Africa. So 
um, you know, consider that also as another avenue uh, to get involved if you are, uh, you know, remote from the United States. So any last questions other than that, because then we could transfer to, uh, I bet, think Becky, next and yeah, last there's poll. one more question, Manisa. Just one hey, more go ahead. Question. Yeah, this is for every speaker. Um, so can you perhaps give feedback about the number of hours you have to commit to for these roles and how the amount of time might vary from section leadership to governor board to ad hoc committees, et cetera, from Jessica Ware. Thank you. <laughs> Jessica, Just you're asking so now? <laughs> Maybe she's asking for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's asking for others. No. So uh, how many numbers of hours? Yes. Go ahead. I, you know, I, I would, I would say that uh, for most of the time, uh, the commitment is maybe a couple hours a month until you get closer to the to the annual meeting for most of the positions up through the section now governing board uh probably depends on what's going on at any one time they might have additional meetings uh and things that they can handle but i think they're able to do a lot of that work by email uh so they only have a you know they have to really have a few uh uh you know teleconference calls or in-person meetings. Chris and Susan would be far better able, or Lena, to answer uh, for governing board or, or higher. But uh, I, I think in all the positions I've ever been in, uh, the commitment was only a couple of hours a month, if that, honestly. Um, so. Lena? So Okay, in my case, uh, for example, being the chair of the Student Affairs Committee, I uh, would say I have to spend more time than the other members. Uh, we organize different activities. Um, I'm guessing uh, no more than 10 hours per month. Uh, also, I think it depends on you. If you really want to uh, get things done, you can do it in a weekend, in one day. So it depends, but you're not know, trying to split the time, I would say 10 hours per month, depending on the position. If you are just a member of the Student Affairs Committee, probably would be three to four hours. So uh, it depends. To give you an idea for the presidency, Jessica, since you're now on that road, um, when you are president, you have weekly meetings with the executive director. And that's just really, it's anywhere from 30 minutes to 45 to, you know, what's happening, what needs your immediate decision or your vision for how it should be uh, done. Uh, you have a monthly meeting with the executive committee and uh, then you meet with the governing board every couple of months or so. So it's, you help set agendas. Um, you get to go to a lot of branch meetings when there is not COVID-19. Um, and uh, meet wonderful people. So it really does, you know, come down to how much you want to do and how much you want to be involved. Um, I was, uh, Rosina was probably rolling her eyes because I am, I was not the most attentive president when it came to coming up with a theme or a logo and, uh, but we survived and uh, got one and uh it all worked so there you are um yeah you'll be great you'll just be great i'm so pleased you were elected yeah i think you can't underestimate or undervalue the esa staff and how they keep you on task and um they will not let you fail too badly and uh, they will help you get things done um I don't know, I, I believe there's, I think there's hopefully still somebody on from the ESA staff. They may be the ones to maybe answer this question a little more, but one last question that came in is, um, what's the schedule for elections and the um, starting terms? And I mentioned at the beginning that June 1 was the deadline for nominations that we showed those positions, but I don't know if anybody, Becky or anyone could speak to the um, other portions of that, like when those terms start and uh, other deadlines. 
and things when that will take place? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Um, so fantastic question, Andrea, and I'm glad you asked that. So the elections themselves, while the nominations are due by June 1, the elections themselves will take place June, uh, excuse me, July 20th through August 18 this year. Um, but those elected officers do not take office until um, November, um, which coincides with the dates of the, of the ESA annual meeting. So you have a few months between finding out that you are, uh, you've been uh, elected until you actually uh, take office. Unless it is branch and then the typically it's at the branch meeting that those Correct. roles change. Correct. Thank you, Susan, for, for um, calling that out. I live in both worlds. I, <laughs> well, um, I am going to stop sharing and let bring Ray to Brat back to maybe wrap us up here and um, let her come back on. But so Ray is before we start. Okay. Can you hear me? Hi, this is Hong Mei. Yes, I can hear Hong Mei. Yeah, it was so, muted, but Hong Mei, go ahead. Oh yeah, oh, this is more of uh, more information or comment uh, from Jessica Ware. She said, um, "Don't forget to mention uh, the really great food um, when when you serve all the roles for the mm -hmm. society. So, uh, great food and great people to work with." Mm hmm. Yeah, so that's all. A good a good comment to end on. Um I was I was so struck by so many of the comments I heard tonight about um you know of course the the roles that we presented in the deadline of June 1st for running for for ESA office that's related to our national positions and branch positions and section positions but across the board so many of our panelists tonight talked about the importance of organizing symposia and how that was a foot in the door in terms of collaborating with with members across the country and taking on a leadership role to craft our annual meeting which is really kind of our signature event for for our whole society. So I, I loved that so many people touched on that. And um, I also, I, you know, again, we invited these panelists because they're awesome, clearly. But also, you know, I didn't know some of these stories about people who had run and maybe not won the first time they ran. So I think that should inspire everyone to seek leadership. You, you know, perhaps you don't win the win the role the first time, but um, you know, keep trying. And um, and the number of people who mentioned about self-nominating. And again, we would love to see more people, you know, who are inclined to serve to nominate themselves. And so, you know, sort of with that final moment, as you're feeling inspired, as perhaps you've had, maybe you've had a glass of wine, you know, take this opportunity and don't think about it too much and get on the, you know, get on the ESA website and uh, go ahead and, and think about um, nominating yourself for a position. Yeah, Floyd. I also just wanted to put in a plug for the incredibly valuable uh, opportunities for serving as moderators and judges mm -hmm. uh, for the student competitions. That's a really low impact uh, on you way of getting involved and it's extremely valuable to the programming committee. And that comes later in the year. So. Uh, mm -hmm. That's an easy, easy sort of way to to give it a try and get to know some of the some of the leaders uh, in your branch and your section, and so on. I, I think the bottom line is, if you have an interest, there are hundreds of ways to step up at at the branch level, the section level, the national level. From like what Floyd just said, volunteering to um, to to uh, judge a student competition, which is which is huge and such an investment in the future of the society to you know seeking nomination for a major national role so there's really something for everyone if you're interested and i hope you gathered that i hope some of the fear of of seeking a leadership role was maybe alleviated tonight and um again i learned like 10 new things even though i've been involved at various levels for a long time so I have no intention to kind of sign up for anything, but I, I'm afraid I'm going to just because I was so inspired by everyone this evening. So 
um, I, I hope everyone else found it useful as well. Um, any final comments that, that anyone else would like to share? Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers. Uh, thank Lena, Chris, Jennifer, Floyd, and Susan for all her pre their precious time and share their experience with us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank, you. thank you for having thank us. You. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Um, so thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in tonight. Hopefully you didn't feel like it was yet another hour at the computer and um, you enjoyed hearing about some of these stories. And um, we'll look forward to a boost in, uh, in people seeking to serve in leadership positions when we check out the, the numbers in the coming days. So thanks so much for tuning in tonight. Um, Becky, any final words from you? Um, did we want to do the final poll um, as to whether people um, are considering running for a position? Yes. Yeah, let's do the final poll. Don't leave yet. Mm -hmm. Leave it open for just a minute. Mm -hmm. Give it a few more seconds to collect a couple of extra votes. While we're waiting, I will just offer, I'm sure my fellow panelists feel the same, that if anyone wants to reach out individually and email me or contact me and ask more questions, I'd be more than happy to talk. Mm -hmm. Thank absolutely. you, Susan. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, this is the best poll ever. <laughs> so that's that's really, um, really great to see that there's so much interest. And again, um, if for some reason, and this year it doesn't work out, please consider seeking office again in the future. That's, that's very exciting. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Yeah, thank Have you, Tori. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.